a little bit here. The word hevel, it's a Hebrew word. It's not an English word. It's a Hebrew word. It's oftentimes translated meaningless. And so when people think of the book of Ecclesiastes, they think meaningless, 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 meaningless. And, uh, but I want to help you see a little bit of what's going on so that when you read it, you'll get, you'll get some understanding. Um, but first of all, I didn't even know what the word Ecclesiastes means. And even after I looked it up in the dictionary, I wasn't too, too sure what it was. But Ecclesiastes is an assembly of people together, a gathering of people like this. And it, it indicates that there's someone that is teaching them, as the video told us, the teacher. So we have a gathering here with a teacher that's trying to tell us some things. Now, just to let you know, the whole book goes on, and it's not until the very last chapter, the very last verses of the last chapter, that we really find out the purpose of what this whole book is about. And so uh, the, the verse that we have to memorize, I don't know if anyone's memorized it yet, but Ecclesiastes 12, 13, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of mankind. Amen. So this goes on and on for a long time. It goes on for, for 11 and a half chapters. And then it tells us the purpose of it. But you know, these verses are somewhat the same as what God's been doing all along. We'll look at that in just a moment. Things that God's been doing all through the Bible, trying to help us to get the point. He's been talking to Abraham. Abraham in the Bible was 1,200 years before the book of Ecclesiastes was written. The book of Genesis was written thousands of years before. So God's been speaking to his people over and over and over again. Hoping that they'll get the message. Amen. And I think sometimes what God, what we find is that God needs to use some creative ways to get His message across. Any of you that have children, have you had to tell them more than once to do something? Whether they're your children that you're taking care of here in Hong Kong or your children back in the Philippines, our children we had to tell them multiple times. Sometimes we had to find creative ways to tell them. So that they would get the message. And I think what's going on here in Ecclesiastes is he writes chapter 1 of meaningless things that don't bring purpose into your life. And people would read that and go, oh, okay, yeah, I guess so. Well, let's do chapter 2. We've got more meaningless things. Let's do chapter 3. Let's do chapter 4. Let's do chapter 5. Did they get the message yet? Let's do chapter 6. Let's do chapter 7. And it goes on and on. We're trying to get the message across. And then at the very end, he tells us what it is. And so I think that's what's going on here. The main idea from this book is that many things have been examined. There's all kinds of things that have been examined. And after everything's been tried, it's determined that the most important thing is to fear God and keep His commandments. So no matter what you try for 11 and a half chapters, the most important thing is to remember um, God and who He is. And so God does these, God uh, has this be written, and the last few verses tell us the important part here, that we are to fear God and keep His commandments. But I wonder, why does it take so long? Why does it take so long? One time I was a Sunday school teacher. Some of you are Sunday school teachers. I saw some of you this morning at the at the uh, 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 teachers meeting, 9.30 this morning. Thank you for, I see a few of you here. Thank you for ministering to children. I was ministering to a group of about 12 or 13 year old kids back in America. And I remember the point of the lesson. The point, I don't remember the whole lesson, but I remember the point of the lesson was that if we do things God's way, it turns out God's way. If 
we do it God's way, it turns out better for us. And I spent the entire Sunday school hour teaching this point and having them do activities and talking about it and everything. And so we get to the conclusion at the end of the lesson. And I asked them, does it matter if we do things God's way? You know what they said? I said, no, it doesn't matter. Wisdom of a 13 year old. It doesn't matter, I can do it any way I want. I don't need to listen to God. Boy, did I feel like a failure as a teacher. I've been teaching the whole, the whole hour. I gave them the, the points in the lesson. And they told me at the end, it doesn't matter. I can do it any way I want. How many times has God told us to do things? And we say back to him, it doesn't matter. I'll still do it any way I want. Well, I was devastated. Sunday school was before the worship service. I'm sure I was thinking about it through the worship service. And I was thinking about it and praying about it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'm like, I've got another lesson to teach next week. What do I do? Do I go on to that next lesson? They sure didn't get the last lesson. How can I get the message across to them? And I think it was about Thursday I had an idea. I had the idea, I think it was with the Lord, that we need to do this lesson one more time. And I said to Mary Ann, on Thursday, I said to her, would you mind baking that really good chocolate cake that you made? Because I want to have it to take my Sunday school class on Sunday. Should be a good thing to do. To make that chocolate cake that's nice and moist and have, to have the good frosting on that cake. And so can you have make it on Saturday and have it fresh? I'll take it in Sunday morning and give it to the students. She said, sure, sure, she's He's fine with that. We had snacks from time to time in class. And I said, just to let you know, so that you're not surprised, I'm going to bake a chocolate cake too. No, I don't need your recipe. The students told me on Sunday that it doesn't matter to follow the instructions. You can do it any way you want. And it'll turn out okay. I figured I'd apply their logic to cake baking. So I want to make chocolate cake too. We live near Hershey, Pennsylvania. We had that good Hershey's cocoa, you know. Hershey's cocoa is good stuff. Man, a chocolate cake eats your Hershey's cocoa, right? The more the better. That'll make the cake taste good. You can smell that good chocolate. Put lots of that in there. Oh, I don't want to make it too sweet. I'll put a little sugar in. And I know you need to have some salt, so let's put some of that in. And I want it to rise, so baking powder, baking soda. Oh, we'll put both of them in. And I don't know what else I put in. But I did it any way I wanted. I didn't get anything that was going to be poisonous. I didn't put any sawdust in or anything like that. But I put that stuff in the cake. And amazingly, it rose. It looked pretty good. It was there in the pan. Turned out pretty good. I said, Mary Ann, would you please frost this? Because I can't do that. I want it to look good. So she put some frosting on it, on my creation. Now I've got another dilemma. This is Sunday school. I'm the Sunday school teacher. i got to get them to eat both cakes without lying to them. So, I went in. We, keep in mind, we had refreshments. These were junior high kids. They would eat lots. We eat anything. And so I went into them and I said, Hey, we're in luck today. Two people have made cakes for us. I didn't tell him to. I said, I'll tell you what, so that people aren't offended, you know, so that after class, if anybody asks, you know, did they eat my cake, I won't have to tell them that they ate all of this one and none of this one. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take one piece from each cake bag. You know what cake tastes like with too much baking soda in it? You know what cake tastes like with too much 
much cocoa powder in it. It smells good, doesn't it? Deborah? <laughs> so they obediently took some of each cake and tried it. And it didn't take too long for them to realize that one of these cakes didn't taste too good. <laughs> too salty, not sweet enough, too much baking powder. Too much cocoa powder. It tasted horrible. I tried. It tasted horrible. But I let it soak in for just a little bit. They got more of the one cake. You know, you needed something to wash down that horrible taste. And when they got done eating the cake, I said, you know what? Last week you told me it doesn't matter if you follow the instructions. Do it anyway. I took your instructions and I baked the cake for you. How did it turn out? They talked about that Sunday school lesson for years. They used to ask whenever we'd have refreshments, Post to stand, you didn't make this, did you? They wouldn't eat anything if they thought I made it. We had a five or six year old daughter at the time. She could make cakes and send them in and they'd eat them. But if I made it, they'd never eat another cake because they got the message that it does matter how you follow God. And I wonder if that's what's going on here in the book of Ecclesiastes. God has sent prophets. God has sent uh, teachers. God has sent miracles. God has taken the people out of Egypt into the promised land. God has given them a new country. God has given them a temple to worship in. God has given him his instructions over the course of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. God has been giving them this message. And I think Ecclesiastes is the same message that God has been giving them all along. And he's saying to them, the most important thing that you have to do is to fear God and uh, to, to follow him. Fear God and do what God says. That's the same message. So he's doing it here in a different way. Now I want to ask you a question. What does it mean to fear God? The answer is in in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, that's the answer of what we're supposed to be doing with God. And it says to fear God. Now, would you like to have someone fear you? Oh, I'm afraid. That's not, uh, I don't know how you talk to the Philippines, but fear isn't something that I want people to do towards me. But fear God, I think, has a different meaning. Let's look at some of these verses. Um, and you can find lots of times where it says to fear God. In Psalm 112, it says, Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Well, that doesn't sound like a negative thing. Oh, I'm supposed to be afraid of God. I think it's, it's a negative thing. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear is a good thing here. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What I think it means here to fear God is that you prioritize God above everything else in your life. Amen. You know, sometimes we think, oh, I'm not going to follow God. I'm not going to do what they said I should do in church or my group or whatever. Because I fear what my friends might have to say. I'm afraid it might hurt my employment. 